Hi again, everybody. Thanks for joining us on Celebrating Act Two. As you can see, Art Kirsch and I are with the fabulous John Mariani, the virtual gourmet. Hi, John. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, John and John. Uh, Mr. Mariani, yeah. you, you know quite, quite the large encyclopedic information about wine and wine tasting. And, uh, and the reason I think about it is that you actually wrote a recent article on that. But my wife and uh, uh, daughter, and sometimes um, with our other daughter, goes out and does these little trips to do wine tasting, not only at at um, uh, uh, the the various, uh, like we have Temecula, it's not too far from here, so those areas, but also locally, all of these wineries have seemed to open up tasting bars locally, and uh, they're actually quite crowded. Uh, what's the status of wine tasting in this, in, in this world today? Uh, there are wine bars increasingly, which I think a very, very nice idea is where you could go with some friends and taste a flight of three wines, a flight of six wines all over dinner with your friends. That's kind of a nice and convivial idea. But what I said in my article, or the, the question that I posed was, are wine tastings counterproductive to both common sense and the love of wine? And <clears throat> there are two aspects of that in, in the article. One uh, is the wine tasting that takes place over a long tasting menu. You go to a restaurant where they serve 15, 17 courses. Um, and they're charging for that somewhere in the neighborhood of $350, $450, $600 without wine. And then you add in the wines, you're up to $1,000. So if you're one of the type of people who can afford to dine out like that, and you like to sit at the, at the table for four hours, tasting itsy bitsy morsels of food and matching individual wines with that, Personally, that does not sound like a lot of fun to me. It is an endurance. Uh, there is an arrogance to think that there is a specific wine that goes with a small taste of abalone on which have been put piquito peppers, on which have been laced little uh, 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 needleworks uh, done with tweezers of microgreens surrounded by four micro dots of a reduction of, of duck jus. Um, and then on to the next course, which... Okay, let's put the Gewürztraminer with that. Then on the next course, and oh, let's do a sake with that. And then on the next, I mean, it's just, it gets ridiculous. And those people who, like those who appreciate the emperor's new clothes, will just go, ooh, and ah, oh, I never thought, well, fine. But to me, this is an, an endurance test that I just do not want to go through. Um, plus the fact that it would cost me $1,000 to go through it. Okay, so that's the one aspect. Do you want to eat 15 courses with 10 or 15 different sips of wine? Uh, if that's your idea of a good time, I know a, a gauntlet you can run through and be hit over the head by 25. <laughs> uh, the other aspect is those professionals, wine tasters. Now, these are people who work for the various magazines, um, they have masters of wine. They know a lot about wine and some of them have palettes where they can in fact say hmm i think that this was the 1957 uh, bordeaux from uh, that's a, a parlor trick um i've done that not knowing what the wine is because i paid somebody to tell me what the wine was however what happens is that in most of the wine, let's say wine spectator wine enthusiast decanter magazine parker's wine advocate they will line up up to 50 wines on a table, put them in brown bags and taste them independently. I've also done this and took years off my life. Um, I once judged 80 Chenin Blancs at the Orange County Wine Fair out there in uh, California over two days, 40 each day. Um, not one worse than the other, but one indistinguishable from the other. So that about the 10th wine in, I'd say, oh, hey, this is this is quite good. And about the 15th wine in like this, not because you're drunk, you're supposed to be spitting, which in its own 
uh, way is discussing. Um, uh, the 15th wine, oh, this is truly inferior. So what is to be gained? Because all Chenin Blancs taste like Chenin Blanc, unless they're so awful that they don't. Okay, so you start, I'll give this a 93. This one gets a 91. This one gets a, oh, 87. It's really, I, I don't know how that is helpful. And then you start describing them. And any wine varietal, whether it's Pinot Noir or Zinfandel or Cabernet, um, is, of course, going to taste pretty much what it's intended to taste like, which is the grape from which it came. Um, however, that is manipulated by uh, winemakers, can change because the amount of time spent in a barrel, and if the barrel is made from new oak or, or old oak or American oak or French oak, uh, these types of things are slight variables, but why would you want one Chardonnay to taste radically different from another to begin with? And how many people do you think there really are who tell, tell the difference between one Chardonnay and another and say anything worth saying? Yet at these wine tastings, some of which have been, I've seen guys put on white lab coats to taste wine. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's Monty Python stuff. The other aspect of that is that I was once in Burgundy where they make some of the greatest <clears throat> uh, Chardonnays. Um, and I was at uh, Corton Chaumagne, which makes perhaps the greatest Chardonnay in the world. Very expensive. And we were down in the cellar and they had all the new, uh, all the new wines that are going to be released uh, soon. And they were all in oak barrels, whole room of them. I said, okay, here are all the whenever that was, 1980. Here are all the, the, the new 1989 vintage, uh, which is now being released in 1991. So we taste it from a barrel. Oh, this is really delicious. This is, this is great. It says, well, let's taste the next barrel. Same exact wine. Same exact wine. Nice barrel. Tastes, this is terrific, too, but it doesn't taste like that one. And there's the rub. Even the same exact wine put into the same exact series of barrels at the same time, aged exactly the same amount of time, may taste different. There are distinctions between these barrels. So how anybody can rate, give a rating of a 91 to one wine and a 95 to another wine when you are tasting 50 of them in a row is balderdash. Now they do go on and they say, my favorite is this guy in, in uh, the TV sh uh, show, Psalm for Sommelier. Uh, what I'm tasting is freshly cut garden hose. <laughs> is that a good thing for wine to taste like? And when was when would you recently smell of freshly cut garden hose? Was it last week? And this is like an identical mat. I mean, it gets crazy. So much so that, and I've done this. I go to some dinner somewhere. I was tasting five or six wines, and they'd ask me my opinion, and I would come up with outright gibberish, just gibberish. And everybody nodded, hmm, very perceptive. You know, I didn't, I, I didn't notice that, but that's a, that's a very good point, John. So uh, <laughs> wine tastings can be exhausting. They can be counterproductive. And they send definitely the wrong message to somebody out there, like my brother-in-law, who every year was buying this particular Bordeaux she loved. And he called me on the phone frantic, like, oh, what's the matter? What's the matter? And he says, I see that Robert Parker's wine advocate just gave this year's uh, Chateau, whatever, a, a 90, 92. And, and last year he gave it a 93. Should I buy it? And I said, you are crazy. I said a little stronger than that. I said. You like that wine? Go buy the wine. It's going to taste just like the wine you love. I mean, so anybody who goes by those ratings uh, uh, would, would believe in fairy tales and uh, would believe that John Coleman did not cheat on his high school uh, SATs and, and, uh, and read his exams <laughs> looking over my shoulder. Now, uh, now John, once again, John. At the, black, at the brown bag. Mm. <laughs> when you're talking about wine and brown bags. That's he where knows about that one. <laughs> I, it sure. seems as if uh, you could write a whole book on the the uh, like an epilogue to the grapes of wrath. Um, yes. So basically, you're saying go out, have a good meal, enjoy your wine, and over a period of time, you'll get to discern what wines sort of taste good, 
to your palate with the food you're eating and it's an ambiance you and the individual wine tasting is probably dubious at best i would say, add one caveat to that that it is interesting and mm -hmm. let's say you're having a meal with your wife or two or three friends and said you know i bought three bottles of this same kind of wine uh, let's say it's a Cabernet Sauvignon, three Cabernet Sauvignons from Napa Valley and one from Sonoma Valley. Let's just taste them and see if we see any differences without okay. getting all silly about it. Uh, that That's could... a fun excuse to have wine. That's yeah. all. Yeah. Well, and, you know, I, what? Think... I, I think uh, 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 John Coleman and I, uh, given our, our very fine palate, should start a, 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 a brand called uh, Fresh Cut Hose. Mm -hmm. Fresh Cut Garden Hose. <laughs> Not not fire hose, garden hose. Uh, well, you oh. see, that's Garden, why we'll need Garden you Garden. as an expert to help us. Yeah. And and Art, we'll put them in plastic barrels. Okay. Oh, sure. With a bung, bung uh, ceiling on the top, and straws. We can give everybody straws, reusable straws. Yeah. Anyway, thank you for a taste of wine tasting. My pleasure. Bottoms up. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.